Hello everyone, I'm Bob, this is Lisa, we're from Henrico County Recreation and Parks Department. Today we're doing our second episode on Walkerton Tavern, we've made it to two, Lisa. Uh, if you missed the first episode, we talked about the outside of the building, the grounds, and some of the outbuildings. Today we're going to go inside, talk a little bit more about the architecture, a little bit about the families that lived here, and how the building has been used over the 195 years that this building has been here in the Glen Allen community. So let's go inside. So we're here on the first floor in the hallway of Walkerton Tavern. Now, we talked about the house being a Georgian-style architecture. Well, those characteristics apply to the inside of the building as well. We describe this building as a center hall double pile plan. What that means is the center hallway runs from the front of the house to the back of the house. On either side of the building, there are two rooms. This has a very good advantage during the summer. As you know, Virginia summers are very, very hot, so that sun is breaking those bricks. At night, you could almost call this a brick oven. So all the doors and windows would be open, but in the hallway, that breeze is able to work its way through the center of the house. So Walkerton is a three-story building. Uh, we're in the back hallway, next to this very beautifully built staircase. Uh, it is an open stairs, has another benefit uh, related to the summer, as you all know, summer the heat rises, so as the breeze is coming through the hallway, it's going to rise up to the third floor door the window, and now that helps keep the building just a little bit cooler. Construction on the building completed in 1825. Now we do think that John Walker's vision for this large structure was to function as a tavern. However, he died in 1826, never getting to actually open up the building in operation. The following year in 1827, John White purchased the property. And we do know in 1828 and 1829, so for two years, Walkerton served as an actual ordinary. So basically he had to go to the county and ask for an ABC license to run and serve alcohol out of this facility. Now, before we go any further, I did want to make sure we have some clarification on what a tavern is. Because today, when we think of tavern, we think of a place where you go to have alcoholic drinks. But at the time, taverns served two different roles. They certainly served travelers passing through the area, and this place should have been busy with all the traffic on the Richmond to Louisa Courthouse Road as stagecoaches were coming and going constantly. However, taverns also served a separate function, and that was as a community gathering center. We'll talk more about that later, but you have to keep that in mind. So we think that Walker did actually mean this to function as a tavern because in the inventory of his estate after his death listed five different bedsteads. Now, not all taverns allow for overnight guests, but certainly having five extra beds in the house would indicate that he planned to accommodate overnight guests and travelers. We're here in a, what is today looking like a dining room. However, at the time, we think it might have actually been the bar room. And we still have some evidence today, both in documents as well as in some evidence on the floor and on the walls. In 1936, the Works Progress Administration actually visited this property and interviewed the owners. And they noted some of the architectural features still uh, visible at the time. One of them was that they noted somewhere on the first floor, though they didn't actually say it was in this room, was that even though the wall had been plastered over, there had still been evidence of a window and a railing just off to my side here of where they originally would have served drinks. So that lends some certain evidence to that. We also noticed that by knocking on the wall, we could hear that the wall had in fact been altered since 1936 or so because it had been completely covered back to look like a normal functioning wall. We also have what we call ghosts on the floor. Down on our floor here, we have little cutouts that have been patched where the actual bar would have gone. 
So the bar would have been about probably waist high or so, and then above that would have had bars going up either to the top of the cage or even all the way to the ceiling. And this was so that the owner or barkeep could keep his alcohol locked up and safe so that any overnight guest couldn't accidentally steal his alcohol. Sometimes searching for clues can be something as simple as knocking on the wall, quite literally. See if you can hear the difference where the wall has been altered. The middle sounded different, didn't it? That is more where the solid brick wall has been patched over. Today, the property is known as Walkerton Tavern, but in the past, it had a few other different names. In fact, just after John Walker's death in 1826, the ad showing the house and property for sale simply called it Brick Tavern. In 1844, we find our first evidence of it called Walkerton. Perhaps they got the idea of naming it after John Walker. However, when the county acquired the property in 1995, is when, after reviewing the evidence, we decided to call it Walkerton Tavern. Lisa mentioned earlier that tavern would have been a community gathering place. Now, out of the country in the past, there are very few buildings where the community could gather, typically churches and taverns. Well, there's a few activities that would, really wouldn't be appropriate for a church, so tavern would be that name. But the original design of this building would not accommodate a large room. So John Walker came up with a very unique architectural feature, and that is this swing wall. As you notice, this wall doesn't reach the ceiling or connect to the opposite wall or even to the floor. That's because this wall and swing open and shut. And we're not going to move it today because it's very difficult to move that. And as you can see on the floor, it's made quite an impression as it's been opened and closed over the years. However, we can move for the smaller portion of this wall right here. So we think typically the wall would be closed. However, if there was going to be a dance, a performance, or a show, they needed the extra space, they can swing open the wall. And they have a greatly enlarged room for the community. I have to say, I love this map. This is an 1853 Smith map of Henrico County. And historians, my colleagues, we use this map all the time to do research. And this map is also interesting in its relation to the story of Walkerton. If you look up here at the top, this is near where we are right now. And there, it's noted, there is T.J. Wheeler's Hotel. Well, this map is a little bit ironic because it was printed in 1853. So when they were creating it in 1852, a man named Thomas Wheely was certainly in business. He was the owner of Walkerton, and we do know that he tried to turn it into a hotel and a restaurant and possibly a store. Now, the ironic thing about this is that by the time this map was actually printed and distributed, Thomas Wheely was probably out of business. He owned the property for not quite even a year. Why? Well, we're not entirely sure. What we can do is use some ideas of what we know about the context of the time. And we know that in 1853, Richmond was an up and coming city, and there were a lot of choices as far as businesses in the city. There were a lot more restaurants and hotels and boarding houses and shopping. And Richmond was only about a 45 minute train ride from here in Glen Allen into the city. So for a traveler, even though it makes sense to have a tavern right at the railroad stop here at um, the Glen Allen Station, it would make more sense for a traveler just to continue for a short journey down the road and stay in Richmond, which had much more choices. So even though Thomas Wheely had a history of being a business owner with restaurants and hotels, both before and after this time period, Unfortunately, it just didn't work out for Wheelie. John White sold the tavern and property in 1834, and after that, it changed hands so many times. We had so many different owners, and during that time, we don't always know exactly what the owners 
use this house and the property for? Was it a private family home? Was it a tavern or a place of business or a farm? We just don't know that, unfortunately. But one thing we do know is that Waterton still continued to serve a role in the community. It was still a gathering spot. And we know this because newspaper accounts show us that during the 1850s and once at least during the 1860s, this building served as a voting precinct for local county elections. And we've already spoken about quite uh, the number of owners of the building early in the history. Most of the time, they probably tried to use the building as a business purpose. Evidently, it didn't succeed. So it wasn't until 1857 that the property fell into one family for a long period of time, and that was with the Hopkins family. So they stayed here from 1857 to 1941. Although they use it as their home, the building did still see uh, a little bit of public use. During the Civil War, Josephine Hopkins became the postmaster of the Glen Allen Post Office. Most likely, they operated a post office out of the basement. There is a door from the exterior uh, to the basement. So uh, it probably stayed a post office until the end of the war. However, not long after the war, Walkton again saw it as a public use from 1872 to 1889, uh, both Josephine and her brother Erasmus operate the post office out of the basement as well. When people come through Walkton for tours, uh, they often ask about the Civil War. Now, while the Hopkins were here, uh, the Glen Allen community really didn't see much uh, involvement until the Civil War until May 11, 1864. That was when Union General Philip Sheridan rode down Mountain Road with around 10 to 12,000 men on horseback. So if you can try to imagine what Mrs. Hopkins, as well as the other family homeowners in the area, must have thought when they saw these men coming down the road. And Mrs. Hopkins, along with many of the other uh, homeowners in the area, suffered quite a bit when they came through. Mrs. Hopkins, for example, lost quite a bit of fencing, lost Quite, lost quite a bit of her agricultural products. Her son, Captain George Hopkins, was here um, at the time he was taken prisoner. The last family to call Walkton home was the Bowles family. They moved in 1941. They stayed until about 1985. They were instrumental in getting the property listed on the National Register of Historic Places. At that point, the building was in bad shape. Now, they were unable to uh, save the building themselves, they did ensure that Walkerton would survive when they sold it to Mr. Fleet in 1986. He began a 10 year process of restoring the building. And after that, he sold it to the county. And so it is preserved and protected and open to the public today. Right, in the first episode, while we were outside, I mentioned some of the structural issues that Walkerton had, especially the sinking wall. Now, anytime there's a structural issue on the outside of the building, most likely there's going to be structural issues on the inside of the building, and that is true with Walkerton. Now I can tell you what that is, but I can also show you with a marble. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place the marble here close to the wall and let it go. And as you can see, it's going to start rolling across the floor. Now depending on the season, environmental conditions like temperature or humidity, I can place the marble in the same place and every single time it's going to roll in a different direction. In this case, you see it roll out the door and it's heading toward the back of the building. Another issue we've had with the floors is that there are some gaps between the floorboards. As the floor settled over time, uh, the tiny groove portions of the floorboards is broke apart. So essentially, you have a tongue that would fit between two grooves and another floorboard as the floor sank they started to break apart, uh, causing the gap in the floor. It happens to be the highlight for many kids when they're taking a tour of Walkerton. So you should be able to see my partner, Lisa, down in the basement. I get the question very often, why didn't Mr. Fleet fix the floor? Why didn't he level it? Well, there's primarily two reasons. One is uh, the cost factor. It would have been very expensive for him to try to raise the floor. But secondly, and more importantly, is that he didn't want to risk damaging more of the original floorboards. For preservation, we want to try to protect as much of the original fabric uh, as possible. So that's why he left the floor sloped. 
Plus, it's part of the character of the house now. Well, Walkerton is 195 years old, getting up there in age, but still quite young at heart. Now, as I've given tours, many people have asked me, Bob, has there been any president that has been here to Walkerton? You know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, I've always had to say no. That changed in 2012 when President Barack Obama came by for a campaign stop. Not only have we had the president here, we've had Hollywood here. Walkerton went to Hollywood, or better put, Hollywood has come to Walkerton. Over the years lately, we've had quite a few uh, historical documentaries here uh, filmed on our property. And so one of those is Legends and Lives. And you can probably go to YouTube and watch one of those shows. See if you can find Walkerton in the background. Well, that's it for Walkerton. Really do hope you enjoyed the tour. If you did enjoy that tour and want some more, go to the Henrico County Recreation Parks YouTube channel to view more videos. On behalf of me, Lisa, and the rest of the Henrico History team, thank you for joining us and hope to see you soon at a historic site. Thank you.